You're good. You're good. Yes, you are. We are. Yeah, I mean, when we put a painting up, we go, oh, well, we know who did that. Yeah. The, the, issue, the issue is, when you're doing the homework assignments, there's been sometimes a, a stop for you. And listening to you, because part of coaching, and this is what I do on the phone, is I, I listen, you know, and when I do my phone coaching, they send me a picture via internet, and then there's no Skype, there's no fancy, I mean, basically, I just have my speakerphone and I set it right next to the computer. I don't look at them, I don't, and I just listen to what they have to say. And I'm waiting for a moment that I can see that I can add a, add a difference in. So when I'm asking you, so, you know, what is the difference? What could I do to make this work for you? And I start asking you questions, and before you know it, we get really to the, to the, to the root of the problem. <coughs> and the root of the problem is, is the subject matter and lighting that. And a lot of artists spend a lot of time really working that out. And I think the, I would almost rather not have you do any homework assignment this week if you spent you know, four or five hours doing your homework. I'd rather have you spend four or five hours on trying to figure out how to work with your setup. I mean, it's that crucial. The issue with, with painting in general, yes. artists don't know how to paint everything in the world. If somebody said, oh, go paint a dead fish, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume. I mean, I did a painting called The River Bandit, which is a river marten, and he's standing on a fish that he just caught out of the river. I mean, I don't assume that I know what a fish looks like, even though I used to fish a lot growing up and, you know, um, and I love nature, so I studied a lot. But I would not sit down and try to paint a fish without having a fish in front of me. And I think part of the problem, too, is that we're so instant with Google and all these different things that we lost the idea that working from life is really the treasure. Mm -hmm. So, you cannot perceive of how things will look unless you're actually looking at them. You need to see your subject matter in its best light, the way it's going to. And it, it is futile to try to make it up. Down to every part of it, because everything you put in, if I go and set up a still life and I put in this red box, into my still life. This red box affects everything that's in that, in that space. Not to mention that just putting this red box into this picture would be horribly distracting. You know, so you can't just put everything in and expect it to work. But when you choose finally something that you do want to put this red box into your picture, then how does that red box affect everything else? Well, you've got, first thing, the light's going to be hitting this too. And it could distract from, I mean, if you're doing everything in pale blue and you got a red box, that's going to be very distracting to look at. So, how does that affect, if you're going to put that in, it's like, well, how do you make it blend in? How do you, how, how does that work? And you have to figure that out before you even start painting. Do you put this into shadow? Do you darken it? If you're going to highlight it, get that, everything around it will have a cast red on it. This will actually even put color onto the table. Things that you normally don't think about become very, very important when you start putting together still life. You can't know all the rules, what's going to happen. It's just like when you look at rocks. You know, I ask students to paint a rock. They go and they put in the highlight and they do whatever they do. But, well, they, yeah, well, we get into that another, another time. But the, the issue is, the issue is, is that, yeah, we know that light hits rocks, right? But the subtle thing that's almost as important as the key light that hits that rock is the reflective light that comes from the atmosphere. And if you actually block the light that comes this direction, you almost have a secondary light that could be as strong as the key light that causes its own shadows. So not only do you have to worry about the object being lit correctly, 
but all of the other objects that are reflecting off of each other become part of the play. And we think that that's really subtle, but if you really start studying still lives, you realize that the reflective lights, the secondary lights, are as important as the key light coming into the painting. But you can't know that unless you're looking at it. And you can't know that even if you're guessing at it. Now, a lot of you work from photographs, which is fine. Somebody else has spent the time to do that. But how do you do that at home? You've, you've got to set it up, and you've got to paint what you see. It's like with Mrs. Gugolinsky. Now, if you're going to paint Kuroskoro, where you have the, the objects coming out of the dark, then you probably have to darken the room. And you've got to sit in darkness and paint. Now, we live in a wonderful era where we can buy little lamps, barbecue lamps, uh, music light lamps, and we can put that over our canvases and light up right where we paint. They're LED lights, they work on batteries. You attach that to your easel, and you can be totally in light in your spot and it casts no light on the subject matter. And so you could paint in the garage. Who said painting in the garage? Yeah? yeah, but what I'm saying is if you're painting from life. Photography deadens a lot of this, these subtle colors too. Remember the artist's eye is much more sensitive than a camera, camera is. The digital cameras are better, but there's nothing like actually looking at it and actually even walking up and putting your hand in the still life to find out if I block this red. If I, if I set this into a still life and I just cover this, you'll see all of a sudden your, your still life will lose some reflective light. And you can actually see where that, where that uh, light is actually reflecting on. And it's not just one thing, it's like everything. Everything you stick into there is going to affect everything else. So painting from life on a subject matter that's just like you imagined is the key to painting. So when you're setting up a still life, that space in there that you're painting from absolutely has to be the end product. You should be able to take a photograph of that space and swear it's the finished painting before you start painting it, including the walls. You know, there, you, know you look at LaFell's still lives, which are absolutely extraordinary. But if you see his setups, he's got Chinese wallpaper, Japanese wallpaper in back with a burlap piece of cloth that's torn on the side. He's got tables, not just regular tables, but pieces of marble that he sets the, the, the subject matter on because the reflection of the marble is important key onto the subject matter that he paints and vice versa. All those subtle things. And you've got to generate the curiosity of going, how do I take this to the next level? Just like you do with your portraits, just like you do with everything else. It really is important. And you're not the only one. Listen to just this room. And I mean, I lecture you guys a lot. And people wonder, you know, like on YouTube, I've got all these YouTube videos and people go, wow, you know, you kind of have the same information. But yeah, I have to say the same information. And it's not just this class, it's all my classes. And so don't think I'm picking on you. I'm just using this as a, as a thing. So what we need to do is we need to find out how to take care of your studio. You need to have that box that I told you, you know, that's something you can set up. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to, to spend some money on getting a wooden box that's, that's black, that is on hinges that you could put away? Because one, if you're going to put a box in your studio, it will probably start getting loaded up with stuff that you don't know where to put anywhere else. So your books will start filling it up and stuff like that. So you want to be able to put it away when you're not using it, so that when you're ready to use it, you can put it up. Mm -hmm. It's, sur it's sturdy so that you can put all kinds of materials on it. You want to know that this week you can go home and you're not going to have to worry about finding another box or a shelf that you could put something on. So it's a good sturdy beginning to start off with. Then you have to think about, do you have fabrics? Do you have wallpapers? So you go down to one of the decorator stores and you say, are you throwing away any wallpaper um, sample books? And the sample books are usually pretty big. You just go through and slide in that. Keep that in a box in your studio. You could put it right next to your, your wooden box. And then, so now you're set up. Now you've got the lighting issue. We live in a time right now with LED lights. They have these wonderful long-armed lights with these little tiny pinhole lights at the end of them. 
You know, there's some for computers, televisions, bedrooms. They have clamp-ons, battery powered. They have all of these wonderful lights that we didn't have. I mean, can you imagine Cezanne or, or Rembrandt having a flexible light that they could paint all night with? I mean, it's almost a crime that we have everything available to us and we don't take advantage of it, you know? I think about Thomas Moran, poor Moran, in the middle of the winter, trying to paint it in his studio with the little bit amount of light that he could get late afternoon, you know? It gets dark around four o'clock, five o'clock in winter, you know? So a lot of artists had to stop. Other artists had to like paint by candlelight. Imagine how wretched that would be. You know? And flickering is like you're sitting there trying to match color and you have all of that light on there doing the thing. So you could go down to Fry's or, or Walmart and look to see what kind of lights they have. If you want to paint Kuroskuro and you want to paint in a dark room, get yourself a picture light that's battery powered, LEDs. They even have them on dimmer switches and you can attach them right onto your painting. Barbecue lamps. There too, for 20 bucks you can get one. When you do paint, planar painting outdoors at night, when we do nocturnes, we use headlights. We do. Can you imagine a, a Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel? How, how wonderful it would have been for him to be able to be up there instead of holding a candle to actually have a headlight, you know, paint, you know. I mean, we live in that kind of time. I mean, there's no excuse. Why aren't artists using these things? So, but you, you know, you can get those lights that you and put over your canvas. So, you pitch dark, you could sit there and paint. Mm. When we were at the plein air conference, everybody had their lights on their paintings and they wonder, how do you paint in the dark? Very well, thank you. <laughs> you know? Because I've got a few tools and they're cheap. So, you could go and see what kind of little lamp that you can buy that you can attach. You don't have to buy a $300 lamp. It's nice when you have it because these are really powerful. Mm -hmm. But sometimes these are too powerful and they just flood the light too much. But then when that happens, I got a dimmer for this. Oh, do, you? do what you have to do. Then when you set up your images, you set it up in any way you can. Take paper, plastic, make little tubes, be creative. It's kind of like part of the joy. Kind of say, you know, maybe I won't even paint this. I'll just take a really good photograph and set it up exactly the way you want it because it's impossible as a student to know how cast shadows look. It's impossible for a student to know how light goes through the, the little flakes of garlic, you know, the little paper garlic things, how light goes through those. You have to sit and look at how light goes through that. How can you make that up? How can you make up corn silks and know how light's going to play in that, especially in a dark background? And remember that a really good painting is 90% darks, 90% shadows. Now the old masters, they went dark, dark brown, dark green. Mm -hmm. They had it really dark. It doesn't have to be that. If you look at Monet, Cezanne, they had shadows, but they were light shadows. Mm -hmm. But you can fix all of that by putting in a white tablecloth. You don't have to use a dark tablecloth. And you could have a light wallpaper in the background. Just put it in shadow. Don't throw so much light on it. And then, what's the key? Focal point. Decide where you want that light to hit. The focal point in a painting should be about the size of a silver dollar. And yes, they still make one because I got one this week. You know the old Eisenhower dial dollars and stuff? Yeah, they still make those. So if you don't know how big they are, go to the bank and say, I'd like to have one of those Eisenhower dollars. Um, I think they're Eisenhower, I'm not sure. Uh, but this, the silver dollars. Mm -hmm. Put it on your canvas and say, I am only going to have light in this area. And then illuminate. And then how do you get, you know, there's so many things you've got to think about. It's hard to keep your eye on the same focal point when you've got so many things to paint when you're not looking at something. If you're just looking at it, and yeah, you could make it up. If you've done 100,000 paintings, you could sit and make it up. I'm sure Richard Schmidt could sit in a dark room with nothing and He's got enough stuff in his head. But when you're running into your homework assignments, and then you are so good at rendering what you see when it comes to painting from photographs and people and things. You're so good at that. If you applied yourself to that, 
to still lifes and sit there and look at your still life and go, that's the color, I'm putting it down, that's, that's the shape, that's the thing. And you're just very careful at the drawing and everything else. And you paint it just like you see it there. You're going to have a different experience to this whole thing. It is amazing. I mean, even a couple weeks ago, remember, there was kind of a quiet class, so Rada was doing the little honey bear honey thing. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And, you know, nobody was here. So I said, let me just do a quick demo. And so it, it is so awesome to sit and look at something and just render it, just like you see it. I mean, without any interpretation. And then uh, people are like going, well, artistic license. Well, that's overrated. First learn how to paint what you see, Mrs. Gugolinsky. <laughs> Paint what you see first. Mm -hmm. Once you figure that out, then go ahead and be artistic licensed. But at this point, if you're not able to paint what you see, then that's what you need to practice. But when you start painting what you see, and you start painting like the honey bear, and then you start painting the plastic container, and then you paint the honey and the, the glow inside, it becomes kind of really fun. <laughs> it's, it's, almost, it's almost too much fun. That was a great lesson. Yeah, but, and it didn't take long. No, but it was just a little sculpting here, yeah, yeah. and then it looked just like the picture. Yeah, we were only three, you and Radha, I, and somebody else. Yeah, see what happens when you go home early? Mm -hmm. Great things happen. Um, but the thing is, so get yourself a light, get yourself a box, get yourself a shelf, you know, a, 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 a stand, a clay making stand, mm -hmm. something. No, well, you could do that, but the collapsible box, I'll, I could give you a phone number of a gal who makes them, and I can bring them down to you, but you can, she, she, does, them, she, she does a really nice job with them. I highly recommend them. And she does a piano, they run about $50. Um, no, I'll give you the phone number, you call her, and I'll bring them to you so you don't have to pay shipping. Because okay, okay. shipping's a little expensive because mm -hmm. it's heavy, and it has to be heavy because you want to be able to drape stuff on it. And the problem with the cardboard boxes is that it shifts, it moves. This thing you put down and you could put a heavy blanket on the edge if you want to, you know, play with it. Um, but it's kind of just getting the tools in order. And this is where women are different than guys. Women have, because they, they make shift they figure it out. They, whatever they need to do, they'll figure out a way. They're, you know, and they like to like, you know, make sure they don't overspend on especially things that they want to do for themselves because they want to have money for their kids, their family and stuff. So it always make do. Guys, when they're going to go buy tools, they're not buying down at Walmart. They go down to the tool store and they kind of hang around there with it. <clears throat> yeah. Give me one of those big saws there. Yeah, not the cheap one, the more expensive one. And they'll load up their garage with all the tools and they'll never do anything with them. Some of your husbands are like that. How many, t how many times? Yeah. He's got everything he needs, but yet he doesn't go out and do it. Women will work with nothing and make fantastic things out of them. I mean, that's just the difference between men and women. So you need to allow yourself to say, you know, I'm going to spend some time. I'm going to get the right supplies. I'm going to figure out lighting on the way home go to Best Buy and ask you know do you have any you know LEDs on on handles um, if you want something stronger they make little battery powered super highlight I don't know if you've seen them on television but I mean these little LED lights are like headlights and they're really small and you can buy them and they keep them in your purse and they flash and do all kinds of things there's so many things that are available right now in very miniature way and you can attach those things without having to spend this kind of money for this. This kind of money is great because you can move this around your box. And if you have a table that moves, then you can move that, you can move this, you could twist this, because everything helps when you're creating. Because if you have your, everything sitting on a table, and you say, God, I wonder if I would change the angle, you'd have to shift and move, and then you're spending a lot of time redirecting. Where if it were on a swivel, you put the box on a Lazy Susie, you can tap it and you can see what it looks like. And remember, once it's set up, you put the light on, then you go after finding something that's interesting. Not the subject matter. Forget the subject matter. Look at that as just stuff. That's your stage. And then you start moving the light around until something shimmers. Like diamonds. 
So something casts a shadow. Something that becomes more interesting than the subject itself. Now, once that happens, now you are ready to start painting. Once you do that and you start following painting what you see, you're going to have a different relationship with your subject matter.